Hello everybody, Ian here. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm an American um, in Russia on a tourist visa who is taking Russian language courses in uh, Moscow. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the situation in Russia economically, what I'm seeing on the street, and I'm also going to talk a little about some of the um, big events in the news over the past week, including the uh, moving of tactical nukes into Belarus, the video of T-55s and T-54s, and a few other odds and ends. Uh, I created this channel because, um, well, I've been blogging and writing actively about this topic for the past about year and a half, but I realized some people like listening rather than reading, so I decided I'd try something a little different. And also sometimes I just feel like talking rather than writing myself, so it's convenient for me too. But anyway, uh, so first off, um, I've been here, I've consistently been here since um, summer, and this, and I've visited a couple, t visited Russia a couple times prior to that, so, but I've pretty consistently seen what's going on here um, since last winter. As far as, you know, this idea of how are the sanctions affecting the Russian people, affecting the Russian economy, um, so basically this question of do sanctions work? And the answer, the short answer is no, no, they, <laughs> they did not, they did not work at all. And it, believing the sanctions would work was wishful thinking at best. And this shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone who's been paying attention or wants facts rather than dreams. I mean, not to say sanctions are useless, they do work gradually, incrementally. Um, they weaken a country's economic standing, they increase internal divisions, people start to ask why is our government weak? Why aren't they fixing this problem? So that, I mean, that's, that's essentially the purpose of sanctions. But the problem is that they can weaken a country's economic growth. They can cause a lot of problems, but they really, they rarely actually cause regime change. Even very small countries like an island nation of Cuba it didn't work there. It didn't work in Iran. It didn't work in North Korea. It, there's very few actual success stories that can be attributed to sanctions alone. Even Iraq, which was sanctioned for years and years and years, did not collapse. Saddam stayed in power. The only thing that removed Saddam from power was actually invading the country, defeating its army and occupying it at great expense and loss of life. So to believe that sanctions would work on a world power, on a much larger country with its own natural resources, its, mo its own self-contained economy that isn't dependent on imports was just wishful thinking and there's no other, there's no other word for it. Part of the, I, my theory on why so many people thought sanctions work, and I do think it's a true statement to say that a lot of people in the USA and the European Union believed sanctions would work and they weren't lying when they believe, when they stated that it would work on Russia um, was their own was their own biases at work uh, especially back home in America uh, we have this economy that's built on essentially the service industry. We have this financial sector, we have this extremely bloated healthcare sector. We spend huge amounts of money on um, extremely abstract products that don't have any real values. Like, for example, Elon Musk spent $40 billion on Twitter, but Twitter, I mean, Twitter does have physical assets, it has the servers, it has the employees, it has the workplaces, but come on, Twitter is not worth $40 billion. It's, just, it's, it's a very bloated, we have a very bloated system where we attribute 
basically a fictional value to um, assets that don't actually exist in real life. So there's there's physical things that have value. So Russia has can grow its own food. They're a net food exporter. That's a fact. That's not propaganda. That's just a fact. They're a net energy exporter. We had this idea that, oh, well, if we cut off Russia from SWIFT, if we cut them off from being able to use their Visa cards on vacation, if we cut them off from all of these fictitious or abstract um, devices that we've built and run our economy on, they'll just collapse. And that was, um, it, that's a delusion we built around ourselves. This is more about us than it says about them. Um, I mean, especially SWIFT. I mean, SWIFT is an interesting idea, but at the end of the day, it's just it's zeros and ones on a computer screen. It's not, it's something that can be replicated, and it was silly to think that they would just not be able to buy things after we kicked them off SWIFT. That was just, it was, it was a very foolish thing to believe. And the bigger impacts, the bigger global impacts of these sanctions, um, and this actually applies also to this ICC ruling that Putin is a war criminal. It's basically um, taking these international institutions. So, you know, in the 20th century, after World War II, we built these international institutions that we say these are global systems that are unbiased, they're not political, regardless of the feuds happening between various countries like the Soviet Union or the USA, it, you know, it's not political. We're not going to um, enforce the political whims of any particular country. And that was, in hindsight, it probably wasn't even a true statement, even when these institutions were implemented, but we had a good job of pretending that these were neutral institutions for a very long time. But now it's very clear that, um, for example, SWIFT is not neutral. It's just, all it is, it's an American system. We can shut off anyone we want. Uh, and we got away with shutting off smaller countries like North Korea, uh, Iran, Syria, um, most people don't um, associate themselves with those countries, you know, so if you're, for example, you're the president of China, you're the president of France, you're the president of South Africa, maybe you don't sit there and think, well, you know, what if I get cut off like Iran did? Well, no one, no one you know, it ha just happened to them. It's not a thing that could happen to us, but when Russia, which is a major country in the world, gets shut off, that, that shut off alarm bells in everybody's head. So it's like, well, okay, that, that really, it really could happen to anyone. It could happen to us. Um, it's kind of an emperor's, the emperor has no clothes moment, really. Um, and I think that in the long term, that you, know, you might not see the impact of that right away, but in the long term, you are going, that is going to severely erode the trust in the American system, in the dollar, in these global institutions that uh, we've pegged our economy to. Now to talk about some of the events in the news lately, so the big one, I'd say the biggest one is this talk of uh, Russia sending tactical nu nuclear weapons to Belarus. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of chatter in the news. I think most people miss the point. So, um, now first off, this isn't the first time Russia's brought up nukes. It's not the first time we've brought up nukes. Um, but I've seen this kind of unsettling trend whenever nuclear weapons come into the equation. We, we've, I really see a lot of people in the U.S. State Department and in the media, like CNN, um, really trying to downplay the risks. They really want to sell this uh, war in Ukraine as um, as this adventure that has no risk to it. There's no chance of nuclear war, so they really go out of their way to say, "Well, you know, nuclear. Well, don't worry." 
Russia's corrupt, their weapons don't work, their nuclear weapons don't work, and it's just it's a very dishonest and dangerous game to play to try to, because normally if people knew the risks of nuclear war, they'd say, hey, it's not worth it. You know, it doesn't matter if, you know, the invasion of Ukraine is brutal and awful. It's not worth risking, you know, everybody being wiped out. You know, that's what a typical average person would say. So, you know, the media goes, oh, no, 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 no. It's not a risk. Don't You don't even have to worry about nuclear war. Don't even think about it. Um, as far as moving smaller nuclear, shorter range nuclear weapons to Belarus, um, you know, I see a lot of posturing, a lot of theorizing. I think the biggest and most obvious reason for doing that is to dissuade Poland from getting involved. They might have, because they have made noises about because that, that's also happened, that happened a few days ago. Um, Poland suggesting they might intervene in Ukraine regardless of what the USA does, regardless of what NATO does. Um, and I've actually speculated on that before. In, our, in previous articles and posts I've written that Poland might um, be that second um, pool of human resources to push into the front once Ukraine is depleted and the, two, the Russian tactical nukes and Russian tactical nukes right there near the border would be a pretty obvious um, way to dissuade the Poles thinking of doing that. The other big event from this week was this viral social media video that appeared on Telegram and Twitter uh, showing a train load of T-54s, of Russian T-54s going somewhere and of course they're obviously going to Ukraine as the story goes. Um, now first off, I've long stopped taking these videos seriously every time you see a train of a vehicle regardless of what it is they claim it's going to Ukraine and whether or not that's actually a true statement. Uh, there was even earlier videos of, T of T-34s from World War II on a train. They claimed those were going to Ukraine. Of course that's not true. It was not even from the same year. As it, as it turned out it was actually a video from 2018 of T-34s being sent somewhere for some event within Russia. Um, so when you see these videos they need to be taken with a grain of salt. So there's not a lot of point in endlessly thinking and speculating about every rumor that appears on the internet. But at the same time, um, it's not impossible. Uh, the scale of the fighting there in Ukraine is vastly exceeded what anyone on either side really expected. Um, there's, for example, no one, ex I don't think anyone really predicted it would chew up thousands of drones, it would chew up uh, millions and billions of rounds of um, artillery munitions. Um, it's, it's, it's vastly exceeded the scale and the intensity that anyone expected going into this. And it's also, it's not also, it's also not being fought the way anyone really expected. Um, the opening week or so of Russia's special military operation when they sent troops into northern and southern Ukraine, that was kind of what I think everyone expected that would be this giant maneuver warfare, you know, vast armored formations from both sides maneuvering into giant pincer movements and be very fast and dramatic and that's not that's actually not how it played out it turned into much more it's really stopped being a maneuver war um firepower completely replaced maneuver no one's really dramatically maneuvering anymore it's just bludgeoning each other with um direct and indirect fire weapons um not, no one's really concerned about taking ground. Um, 
which is kind of funny because that's all the media talks about. It's all about how much territory has one side taken or the other, and it's... But in real life, I think both sides have kind of realized that it almost doesn't matter who takes what, um, as long as one side doesn't lose too much. I think that's, that's, that's what it is. You can't lose all of your territory. There's, a certain, there's limits to how much you can lose, but... Um, at the end, when the war is over, it's not going to matter where the front line is. I mean, they could, Russians could be outside Kyiv, or they could be where they are now. They, um, it, it doesn't matter if there's a political solution. It's, it's not, um, so basically, long story short, it's, it's not a war that's going to be won or lost by taking terrain. It's going to be won by destroying the equipment and personnel on, on the ground. And even more so, it's, it's, it's also an economic war because the fact of the matter is um, Ukraine is not a self-contained unit. They, they are not producing their own war material. They're not even um, relying on their own finances. They're completely dependent on the USA. So the minute that something happens, like with Afghanistan, um, for whatever reason, USA stops sending weapons and money into Ukraine, that's when the war is over because they do not have their own internal ability to continue the war by themselves. That's when the war ends. So it doesn't matter if more territory is taken. It just doesn't matter. It's, the, it's a logistical and economic war, not a maneuver war. And so back to the tanks. Um, it's conceivable, assuming it's true and it's not fake news, that there's T-54s going to Ukraine. Um, it could make sense that on the Russian side they want more of those large cal caliber direct fire weapons, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, you have a lot of long range weapons on both sides. You have drones, um, you have satellite imagery. Um, your standard self, um, lightly armored, self-propelled artillery is very vulnerable to, uh, for example, suicide drones. So having an, up, an armored tank, even an old one, does provide the crew more protection than standard artillery. So if, you're, if you just need another barrel to pummel the enemy 24-7, a T-54 is fine. You're not using it to assault enemy positions. It's not, it doesn't need to be particularly durable. It's just meant to sit there on the front lines and shoot at enemy trenches all day. And also the other potential benefit to using T-54s is that T-54s and T-55s um, are, are, do not have compatible ammunition with later models, T-64s, T-72s. The 80s, um, they use 100 millimeter ammunition, so it's possible that there's a lot of 100 millimeter ammunition just sitting in stockpiles, not being used, and there's nothing even involved in combat operations that can even use the ammunition. It's just sitting there, so there there might be this light bulb going off, and someone says like, "Hey, why don't we just pull these T-54s out of storage? You have more guns." pointed down range and you also have another avail this opens up another available stockpile of ammunition that's just sitting there and we can use it right away. So that's a potential explanation for what's happening. So this idea so basically the premise of the original video that they're out of T seventy twos or two eighties is well it's false because they're not. And also just you're not seeing these big dramatic maneuvers that require tanks in offensive operations. It's just not how they're being used most of the time. They're just, they're just being used as, um, it's actually ironic, they're actually being used a lot like uh, tank destroyers in World War II. Um, you had these, a lot of these turretless tank destroyer models that just had large guns. They functioned almost the same as a tank, but, did it, but lacked the armor, lacked the turret. Um, and they were just used as mobile artillery platforms to unload on enemy positions as both offensive and 
defensive weapons. So it's kind of interesting to see that's potentially the direction we're going back to now. Thanks for listening, and uh, I will also post some ad some additional links in the comments um, with additional information about some of the things I've talked about, as well as other to related topics to the war and Russia in general. Thanks for listening, and uh, let me know what you think.